if you look at where we are, oh, I guess this isn't in nothing. So we've certainly done our stuff on, uh, well, you recognize this, right? So we dealt with the uh, diffusion equation first. We've dealt with the advection diffusion equation to know how that sec first order term works, how this second order term works, how this zeroth order in time term works. And we saw how all those, those have gone together. Um, and now we're looking at problems which are no longer scalar but are, are vectoral in terms of either displacements or velocities through either Navier-Stokes or um, through solid mechanics. And so that's where we are. And uh, we've in each of them we've done this thing of uh, developing individual elements, you know, the concept, one-dimensional elements, two-dimensional elements, doing some simple problems, etc. So I think what we have remaining, I just sketched it out today for my own uh, uh, benefits because I'm not sure quite where we are. So we're talking about solid mechanics. We've done virtual work. Uh, I guess this is not in uh, skim, so I can't do that. Uh, we've done 1D and 2D examples. So the one thing that makes um, solid mechanics and Navier-Stokes flow slightly different is that when you take out one of the dimensions, so if you start out with a three-dimensional problem, we said that the only difference between Navier-Stokes and solid mechanics is the form of the constitutive equation. Uh, we're satisfying equilibrium, uh, F equals MA basically, in each of those systems. Uh, and the only thing that makes them different is that in one we satisfy Newton's law of viscosity where you apply a stress, a constant stress, shear stress, you get a constant velocity. And in one if you apply a constant, in Hooke's law, you you apply constant shear stress, you get a constant displacement. So stress gives a displacement in one, stress gives a velocity in the other. But other than that, they're exactly the same. So in this constituent relationship between these two models, uh, Newton's law of viscosity in one and Hooke's law in the other, uh, it's not quite as simple as in the cases of diffusion equation and vection diffusion equation, when you just trim one of the dimensions away, so go from three dimensions to two dimensions, you just take out that row and column of the constitutive matrix. Um, in both of these other cases, you have to actually provide a different condition. And we won't talk about it for Navier-Stokes, but it's kind of the essence of uh, solid mechanics, is that if you want to deal with two-dimensional problems, you have to describe some kind of uh, constraint on the constitutive relationship. And so the physical constraint on it would be that, well, that, so that's going to, so the big picture today is that we'll spend some time mm -hmm. talking about the constitutive equations and how you cut them down from three dimensions to two dimensions to one dimension, which allows you to solve uh, for the, the appropriate problems. We'll try, e.g., FEM for a quick validation problem with the very simple two dimensional geometry, the one dimensional geometry we had for our example, but using a two dimensional <coughs> geometry. And then we'll try and log on to ComSol to see if we can get on and uh, use solid mechanics on ComSol. So that's the plan for today. So those are these first things here. So talk about the constitutive behavior, talk about implementation in EGE. I'm not going to talk about thermoelasticity, and then we'll talk about ComSol. So then the other big picture things that we'd like to do is now we're in a position to start linking these codes. We've done it for flow, where we looked at linking uh, fluid flow, transport and reactive chemistry together for a couple of species. That was our only real foray into linking the different modules in ComSol. But when we do this, uh, the most logical one for us to first deal with, maybe, is hydromechanical coupling. So you have the linear equations for solid mechanics, and you have the linear equations for fluid flow in porous media. And we want to know how they interact with each other. Certainly we can run those codes together, those modules together without any communication. But we'd like to figure out what the feedbacks are in those systems. So that's our first one. So we'll talk about BO pore elasticity uh, and uh, how to link it in ComSol. Maybe we'll talk about dual porosity, dual permeability problems, because it's, that's perhaps a, a preamble into this. We can talk about coupling thermohydromechanical models. Uh, uh, and we can do it through ComSol, which is what we'll talk about in these three. And then we can talk about it by executing two different codes. Flow code, solid mechanics code, how do they talk to each other, what variables do you exchange to be able to run them in sequence. Run the flow problem, get the fluid pressures, uh, put them into the solid mechanics one, get the changes in fluid pressures from def deformation, 
And so, actually, that's how you do it. I mean, that's, it's, it's as simple as being able to say that. Maybe it's a bit more involved. So that's kind of where we're going with this. So the other things I'd like to do um, are to talk about three different uh, methods, Lagrangian and Eulerian methods, which are ways of being able to solve problems where advective velocities or advective accelerations are high uh, by doing it in a two-step <coughs> process. I'd like to talk about level set methods where we can look at uh, inhomogeneities and multi-phase flow, for instance, um, and um, a variety of different problems. So we'll talk briefly about level set methods. And finally, I'll talk about boundary element methods. So how you solve the same kinds of problems that we're solving for flow or solid mechanics by not discretizing the volume with elements, but by discretizing only the boundaries. So it seems as if it might be more efficient with smaller numbers of equations, but actually the Although you get smaller numbers of equations, they're fully populated. We've never really noted, noted it in fine element methods, but the, the system equations we have are very strongly uh, banded, so they're very sparse. And so um, even if you're using fewer equations, uh, if they're fully populated, it might actually not be more efficient. Um, but for some physical problems, it's advantageous to use uh, boundary element methods, which include a couple of different uh, techniques. And then it's up to you. Uh, Lattice Boltzmann, Smooth Particle Hydrodynamics, XFEM, and uh, Discrete Element Methods, all these acronyms, which occurred to me as kind of interesting, they're just acronyms. And so if that's the last four sessions of class, that's the last two weeks, we have six weeks to go, including me talking now. So it's, yeah, we're, we're there. So those things will be t roughly in the last two weeks of classes. So plan uh, in the the last two weeks of class is to be ready with your stuff uh, to try and to do your thing. Um, if you need more than a period to do it, maybe we'll do it in an evening and have some pizza or something. We'll just do something. something, something. But the last two weeks are the target for that. So that's yeah. In terms of the participation, is it only one session for each team? That's uh, if we use the last two weeks, that's what we have. Um, if we want to use the last four weeks, because one team has two sessions, there's a lot to say in one. Session, right? Yeah. So, and so it could be the last four weeks, in which case uh, I have to talk even faster. No, I think uh, <laughs> we have one, we have one session. Oh, you only want one? Oh, you can. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we'll, we'll keep the last. Is that okay? So how does it look for people? How much time do you need? Is there a consensus? One? Is there, is there a two consensus? Do I hear two? So anyone raise raise one to two? No. I think you might want to. Sub yes. Are you going to do a PowerPoint? Yes, you can. You might sub upload a PowerPoint on. So I'll, I'll make a place for that so that your colleagues can view them in real time. Right? So that might be worthwhile. Yeah, I think it'll be good. So I'll be interested to see. So you might find it. 30, 40, an hour and 15 minutes goes really quickly. So you may regret taking only one. But uh, anyway. So that's where we are. So I think we have enough time to do the things we need to do. I just scribbled this out this morning. I was just trying to find exactly where we were in this class as well. So, all right. Okay. So it was, can you not go? I guess not. In the other reader, you can go down to page something. It's page 269, I think it was. Right? So that's kind of where we are. And I think I've kind of sorted out, with Cooper's help, uh, the problem with uh, ComSol is that it uh, dynamically attaches storage to different ports. And so if you don't get the right port, it doesn't have any memory to be able to, to solve your problems. Okay. All right. So uh, let, let's step, step back. So we talked about, the, when we talk about momentum transport, solid mechanics and fluid mechanics differ only by the fact of the constitutive equations. Um, when you reduce the dimensionality of your problem from 3 to 2 to 1, then you can't just remove the appropriate uh, uh, line uh, for the constituent relationships. You have to do something a bit more. And so you, just to recap from last time, uh, we went through the derivation for this triangular element. I won't repeat it. Uh, the high points, I guess, are that we don't use shape functions, but we use this, this mapping of displacements. We def use those mappings of displacements to define strains just by differentiating them. We realize that these strain <coughs> magnitudes are the things that we need for this A matrix because the A matrix links um, 
strains to magnitudes of dis nodal displacements. And so if we know what the linkage is in terms of the derivatives of this shape, uh, these uh, equations of planes, we can figure out what the A matrix is. And everything else that we did was basically to be able to figure out exactly what the form of the A matrix was, which ends up being a function of coordinates, nodal coordinates. And so with any L with any in any triangular element, the magnitude of beta 2, 1 is just a function of the x and y coordinates of the nodes. And so the value of the A matrix is constant. The value of the D matrix we're going to assume is constant. And so when we come to put this together, we can take this integral and we can shift it over to this side. And if that's the case, then we just need to find out the magnitude of A transpose D A times the area of the triangle and times its thickness, I guess. And so that's, that's really where we are. Um, and so in this, uh, we did it for two dimensions. Uh, I skipped over this. We got kind of short for time last time, I seem to remember. But this little expression was in here. This is the D matrix. And uh, we gave no rhyme or reason for that. And so what I'd like to talk about today is how we get the, this constituent matrix for two dimensions from the three-dimensional case and for the one-dimensional case. Um, and also maybe try... Uh, implementing it uh, just to be able to to show the desire uh, again to reinforce this idea of gigo garbage in garbage out if you don't validate your models to make sure that they um, quantitatively not only qualitatively but quantitatively make sense then um, you run the risk of embarrassment at some time in your your professional career so, to lesser or greater degree right so I'm trying to do this okay so I won't go through this. Um, you may or may not know um, the, the form of the, the strain displacement equations. I haven't used this in a long time. I can't actually remember what the numbers should be for, for this, so I won't put them up. But if we look at uh, stress-strain equations, In other words, Hooke's law for us. Hook with an E. So these are constituent relationships. Um, they all relate to the magnitudes of stresses that are applied on some kind of elemental volume in uh, a global coordinate space. They have magnitudes of normal stresses, sorry, in the x directions, so, no, that's, that's wrong, isn't it? In the z direction, aligned in the z axis, in the x direction, aligned in the x axis, the y direction, aligned in the y axis, and magnitudes of uh, shear stresses that are aligned that are aligned um, in the uh, different axes. The usual convention is the direction which they act, in this case y, and on the face normal uh, to the z direction. So this is shear stress in the yz. So it acts on the plane normal to which, which is normal to the z direction and it acts in the direction of the y coordinate action. So it doesn't matter, matter so much. But the um, strain stress equations that we need to put together are of the form um, that strains in the x direction are given by, so these are for um, isotropic materials. They relate to the applied stresses in the normal directions and uh, the off the Poisson effect stresses in the alternate directions. And so we have three components. This is also written on in the notes, but I just feel like writing it out today. Uh, stresses in the y directions, Poisson ratio times stresses in x and in Z, 
tell me if I'm doing this wrong, bracket here, and likewise in the z direction, 1 over modulus, um, stress in z, minus Poisson ratio, times stress in x and y. So you see some pattern in, in these. And so those are just the, the constituent relationships for the normal uh, strains and stresses. And the shear strains in the combinations of different stresses are just the applied shear stresses in x and y divided by shear modulus. Uh, perhaps I'll write them underneath each other, although it takes a lot of more space. Xz is equal to g, and the shear stress in yz, I guess, are equal to shear stresses in yz and shear modulus. And so there are six, six components that describe these behaviors. And so this is the full system of equations that is put together for um, the, uh, the behaviors that are in 3D. And so we typically want something that allows us to define stresses as a function of strains. We've said that's the case. And so clearly we could write this in some way so we get strains as a function of stresses. Let's call it uppercase A. And if we multiplied both sides, for instance, by the inverse of A, I didn't allow myself much room here, and multiply this one by the inverse of A, then the A inverse A becomes the unit vector. And so um, that just becomes sigma. And so in other words, uh, if we take the inverse of this relationship here, this is the appropriate relationship, which is D. So in other words, A inverse is equal to the constitutive matrix we want. So that's what we can do. So we, we could get the constitutive matrix for three dimensions just by, by uh, inverting that in, a, in an appropriate way. Not going to do it, because we don't need to do it. But our interest is something, something slightly different from that. And so the question is, what happens if we want to be able to represent this behavior just for um, a two-dimensional problem? And so the two-dimensional problem uh, could be, for instance, whatever we want to call it. Let's throw away the y direction. And we'll take a prism that has, it's not a cube anymore, or it could be a cube, I suppose. But it's easier to think of it as a, a thinner lamina, like a, a plate. And it's defined in the x and the z directions. And so we can physically think about uh, two different representations of, of that plate. And that is the conditions that we apply to this uh, face, which is in the plane of the y direction. So this plane could have uh, zero strain on it. So in other words, this would imply that the strain in the y direction is equal to zero. Um, and the shear strains in the, the only shear strains that would act would be the shear strains in the x and y. So the shear strains in, sorry, xz, are not equal to zero. So in other words, physically, that means, this means that this, if we look at the edge of this box here, that it could deform and it could look like this. This would be this particular strain component. It's in the, the plane of x and it's in the plane of z. And all other shear strains are zero. So in other words, uh, we could also write, or should write, that the strain xy and the shear strain uh, zy, I guess all of the strains that contain y in them, 
which would be the ones into the page, if you like, that, that are deforming like this, yeah. deforming like this, you know, this, this, this going into a diamond shape, square going into a diamond shape, are null. And so that's physically representing one case. So that would be the case that, for instance, if you had a dam that happened to be very long in this direction, or a tunnel for that matter, so that if you take any particular section out of here and look at how it expands relative to its neighbor, it's trying to ex each adjacent section is trying to expand exactly as much as its neighbor is, so that the net expansion has to be zero strength. And so the first requirement is plane strength. So in most kind of geological, geophysical, geological engineering, geophysical situations, often two-dimensional problems are taken as being plane strength. The alternative way to think about it is plane stress. Not usually have a hyphen in it, but I'll just put a hyphen in it. And so I said that these are strains, but really we're talking about changes in strains, actually, rather than actually absolute strains. And so in plane stress, the change in stress in the y direction is equal to zero. And um, the changes in corresponding changes in shear stresses. So the change in shear stress in the xy and the change in stress, shear stress in the zy are equal to zero, the same as this. So in other words, if you look at the terms here that are equal to zero in this case, it's the stress that's are equal to zero. I think plane stress is much easier to kind of figure out. Um, the I probably not actually going to use this. So the idea for plane stress is that you know, if this is a sample that you're going to load, if you load it in, in uh, x, which is horizontal, and y, z, which is vertical, then physically what's happening to things, stresses in this plane? Nothing, right? It's got an air interface, and so there's no change in stress as you load it. So nothing's happening in this. All that's happening in plane strain is if you imagine 10,000s of these all in a row, and you try and squeeze it down, this will try and squeeze out by the Poisson effect. Its neighbor will do exactly the same thing in the opposite direction, and therefore there's no net expansion in the, the thickness of this. So that's the physical interpretation. Um, so those are the constraints, if you like, for plane strain and plane stress. So we have to assume one of those. And maybe while we're talking about it, so this is uh, basically 2D problems. So we've taken a 3D problem uh, here, which is really, these are the 3D expressions converted them to 2D. The other um, change from that is to look at 1D problems. So what happens to 1D? So 1D would be exactly, uh, or the extension of that, the corollary if you like, is basically now you take a column and maybe we take just the Z direction as being the direction of interest and we have some stress applied on this and some strain in that direction. And the conditions that we can apply, I'm not sure um, what we should call them. Um, maybe we should call them uh, complete lateral restraint. In other words, if you had an infinite foundation, and you applied a uniform stress on that foundation, then the idea is exactly the same, right? Um, keep that open. Let's go to the easier one. And the, the, the other one would be zero lateral restraint. And so here's the idea. So zero lateral strain is the most obvious one, a column. You have a load in the z direction, you push down on it. There's no change in stresses out here. It can kind of expand as it likes to, and therefore there's no physical restraint on that. And so the boundary conditions for that are that the changes in stresses in each of these off-direction locations are that the change in stress in the x direction equals the change in stress in the y direction, and it's zero. And so it's exactly the corollary, if you like, of plane stress. These two are the same. One happens to be in just one plane, but the other one is, is 
uh, in both planes, nothing changes. So full lateral restraint is would be for an infinite medium which you load in some way. And so if you represent that infinite, that semi-infinite medium by a whole series of these uh, pens in a box, if you push down on all of these pens, they expand laterally, they expand against each other, and each one does the same. And so it can't expand anywhere in this direction, and it can't expand anywhere in the other direction. And so the strain, the, the conditions that have to satisfy this would be the, the change in strains in the x direction and the change in strains in the y direction are equal to zero. And so if you look at the, in, in both of these cases, um, if you look at the magnitude of the stress related to strain matrix, you only have one significant component of strain, which in this case is strain in the z direction. You only have one significant component of stress, which is stress in the z direction. So this can only be a one by one matrix. Likewise, when we go back to, to thinking about this, we have, uh, and I haven't talked about the shear strain. There are no shear strains. All the shear strains, oops, gamma, are equal to zero, all of them. And all of these shear strains, shear stresses, sorry. All of these shear stresses are equal to zero. And so that's the case for this. For this one, what is the constitutive relationship going to look like? It's going to be, again, sigma equals d epsilon. And um, it's for two dimensions, but it's not going to be a two-dimensional matrix or a two-by-two two matrix. It's going to be three-by-three three because what we've done is we've taken care of either one of the um, normal stresses or strains. So we've lost one of those, <coughs> but we've also lost two of the shear stresses or strains. And so if we go back to this, if we lose one of the normal strains, whichever one it is, and if we lose two of these, we're left with two expressions representing shear strains, uh, normal strains, one expression representing shear strains, and as a result of that, this is going to be, this strain matrix is going to be strain in the x direction, strain in the z direction, and shear strain uh, xz. And likewise for stresses, so this has to be 3 by 3. So that's kind of the, the rationale of, of where we're going with this. Um, I don't know whether I want to necessarily bore you with the, the derivation, but um, this explanation, I guess, is, is codified here. Maybe it's worthwhile just running through it quickly how uh, it, it holds together, because then we'll use that. Because this, this is the key to being able to work out a very simple quantification, if you like, of what the stress is and strains should be in your system, and then making sure that your model might satisfy those. So the idea is this. We start off with these expressions. In this particular case, we're going to have, we've just labeled them as 1, 2, and 3 for um, x, y, and z magnitudes. Um, I can probably make it uh, larger by slightly. And so what we're going to do, we're going to say that this is equal to zero, or at least changes in this. And if that is equal to zero, then this has to equal this, right? That's going to be one constraint. We need to keep this one. We need to keep this one. We know that if we're using, what are we using, one and two, we know that we'll keep this. And we'll get rid of each of these. So we have three equations, this one, this one, and this one. The other things that we would imagine is that if we load it vertically so that there's some stress that develops in the three direction, if we load it vertically by some amount, the change in stress should be some amount here. If we load it horizontally by the same amount, then the change in stress in this constrained direction should be the same as well. And so from that, we could presume that the, the Poisson effect magnitudes that we get by applying those stresses uh, would be equal to each other. 
and so we can uh, notice that um, the, the the changes in in the resulting stresses should be the same. And so, if we go down here, do exactly that. So this first observation that these two parts should be equal to each other is given by this first expression here. So in other words, if we apply stresses or in the, the directions that we have, uh, irrespective of the magnitudes of each of those, they have the same effect on this uh, intermediate stress. And we can presumably then substitute for this value here in each of these two expressions. And I think if we do that, we end up with this, this relationship here. Um, if we take these and write them as a matrix equation, we end up with this expression here. Uh, you notice that these individual terms that exist here aren't just ones and Poisson ratios or minus Poisson ratios as they used to be. They're modified by some amount, so they've changed. But we do have a three, three magnitudes of strains, three magnitudes of stresses, and a three by three uh, matrix which links them. This is the matrix we call the A matrix. Um, we notice that the only magnitude of the shear stress that we have is completely decoupled from the other ones. And so there are zeros on the column, zeros on the rows, and so this portion of the matrix and this portion of the matrix are completely decoupled. We take them apart. And so if you want to invert the A matrix, which we do want to do, then you can invert these four parts individually, and the inversion of this is just the reciprocal. And if you do that, you end up with the relationship which we have. And so it's not, it's a bit of a cumbersome procedure, but this portion of the matrix is just from the inversion of that previous A matrix. So this, this is now the D matrix. And the other part is just a straight inversion by uh, messing with this component. And so we have to do that in this case for plain strain. If you do it for plain stress, it's a bit easier. You just throw some terms away. Um, I guess it's a bit tough to go back to this matrix now. I've kind of messed it up. But if you're looking at plain stress, what are we saying? We're saying that the stresses in the third direction would be zero. So these would be zero. This would be zero. This would be zero. And actually, we don't need to do anything other than just use this straight equation without any substitutions and then um, invert it to be able to get the components for that. And so for plain strain, the manipulation is much <coughs> simpler. Uh, the resulting matrix equation is a bit simpler. Um, uh, but you just follow, the, follow that protocol. So what would, so, the, so that's the, the cases for plain strain and plain stress. So what would be the, the behavior that we'd expect, I guess, if we ended up with um, complete lateral restraint? So that's, yeah, that might be worth it. It's not in here, but it's relatively straightforward to, to deal with, right? So what would be the constitutive equations that we'd get in this particular case? The easy one is for um, the plane stress analog. So this is the uh, plane stress analog. In other words, we're controlling stresses. So in this particular case, we have strain in the z direction is equal to 1 over modulus stress in the z direction minus Poisson ratio times stresses in the x plus y directions. We've ch said that changes in these, which is really what this we're interested in here, are these magnitudes here. This is Poisson ratio. And so since the change in this is 0 and the change in this is 0, then the matrix relationship is that strain in Z is equal to modulus times the stress in Z. And therefore, just by inverting that, um, sigma equals 1 over modulus, which is the D matrix, times strain. So very straightforward. So you have one, the, the 1 by 1 matrix which links these is just 1 over modulus. Units make sense. Uh, that doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah, one over e. 
so this is 1 over e minus 1. That's right, right? So, yeah. So you can just check the dimensions. Don't make sense. So they do now. 1 over e, 1 over e is actually e, and so it's the right dimensions. Uh, stress, stress times non-dimensional. And so the modification for this is um, uh, relatively straightforward as well. I guess you need to use two expressions. We know that the stress in Z is going to be equal to 1 over modulus times the stress in Z minus 2 times the stress in X. So in other words, these terms will just be the same, so I've just combined them uh, both. Uh, Poisson ratio goes in there somewhere. And so we need to have some magnitude of the values of sigma changes in sigma x. And so we get that from the strain in x is equal to 1 over modulus times stress in x minus 2 times the magnitudes of Poisson ratio times the stress in z. Um, so since this has to be equal to 0, we know that these two components are equivalent. And if we know these two components are equivalent, we can change that so that which one do we want? We want stress in the x direction is equal to 2 times Poisson ratio times the stress in the z direction. And so what we can do is we can substitute it in here. And if I take my working somewhere else, we end up with the strain in the z direction should be equal to 1 over Young's modulus times stress in Z minus 2 times Poisson ratio times the stress in X, which is uh, times 2 Poisson ratio gets squared, and we just end up with sigma Z. And so if you take out the sigma Z out of there, I'm going to write it down here. Strain in the z direction is equal to 1 over modulus times 1 minus 4 mu, is that right? 4, sounds strange, 4 nu squared times sigma z. And if we invert that, we end up with the stress in the z direction being equal to uh, modulus divided by 1 minus, I think it's 2 new squared, so where have I gone wrong? So, let's see. And this is our D matrix. Just one term, but our D matrix nonetheless. And so, have I, what's, what have I done? It's strange. I'm looking up here, right? Um, two squared. Okay. Well, all right. I, I, yeah, I was just thinking back that that wasn't quite the right number. So think about that. So the bottom line is, so what happens for this? So we have a uh, Poisson ratio, which is always. Um, uh, non-zero, well, it could be zero, zero between zero and 0.5. Um, and so we subtract that from uh, a number. That doesn't look right at all. So does anyone have any thoughts of what, what the, the lack of logic is in, in that? Um, this is definitely right. They have, sorry? There's no two. Shout, shouldn't you shout it out? So there's no new where here. So 
So this is not two. Two nu. Yeah, but there's a value of sigma y and sigma z which we've added together here, right? So we've had to put those together. So do, 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 do I have an answer? One, two, five, let's, uh, let's see if I have. I don't think I deal with it in here. Maybe I don't. No, I don't. I'm pretty sure I don't have it in here. Yeah, I'm just surprised. It's uh, two. Uh, seems to me that it's one minus two new squared, or maybe even an extra term in there. But so I've done some algebra wrong. But the basic idea is this, and uh, that it reduces the uh, effective modulus as, as a result. Anyway, so. Um, Let's go back to this. So if we deal with this, uh, we didn't do an example before, uh, but it's relatively straightforward to um, run you know, this very simple hand calculation thing. Um, if we make life easy for ourselves, for instance, by choosing Poisson ratio equal to zero for quick plain strain problem, and go back to this relationship here for plain stress, if Poisson ratio is equal to zero, then this term and this term drop out, and it's just this term is one, zero, zero. Whoops, sorry. This is one, zero, etc., and just multiplied by modulus. So we make ourselves a very easy case if we we look at um, the case of zero Poisson ratio. Case of zero Poisson ratio, we do wouldn't have to do the plane strain and plane stress conditions become exactly the same as each other, I think, um, because there's no net um, out of plane stress that's generated, and then the modulus just becomes if we take the the modulus goes outside here, and if this is actually equal to one, then the terms on the leading diagonal are ones, and the the shear strain term is one. If we take the A matrix for that particular geometry, it's just a function of coordinates in the x and the y directions. So they just end up for this particular geometry of an element which is, I think, two long and one high. So this is two in this direction, one in this direction. They end up being a particular combination. This is two times the area of the triangle. The area of the triangle is one. And then uh, when we want to put together the stiffest matrix, we said before that this term here, uh, the integral can come out uh, for the fact that clearly this is just a function of nodal coordinates, which for the element remain this, the same. And the constitutive matrix, of course, we're assuming is the same everywhere within the element. And if we then combine these uh, matrix relationships together, we end up getting the the individual components out of it. So nothing more, nothing more than that. Um, and if you then put it together, you can define uh, behaviors in terms of the individual um, calculations. So this is now just by multiplying those matrices together. And I guess the only take-home point from this is that because the individual component matrices that we have The strain displacement matrix and the uh, constitutive matrix both the, these matrices, well, actually the, the D matrix is uh, symmetric and since it's A transposed A of the A matrix, it's not symmetric. It turns out that the resulting matrix is symmetric, so we're only defining the terms here above the leading diagonal. And you see that the terms, well, kind of, on the leading diagonal are a bit stronger in terms of magnitude and size than the terms off the diagonal. Uh, this is just for one element, and so uh, there are some zeros here, but they're actually they're real terms that exist here. They just happen to be zeros because of the shape of the element that we chose. If we chose different coordinate points for the elements, then these wouldn't necessarily be zeros. So it's fully populated, but it's symmetric. And so almost all finite element codes would only use the, the diagonal and the part of other diagonal to be able to solve the, the systems of equations. Uh, yeah, okay. And so the, the reason for doing what we've done is that it'd be nice to be able to figure out exactly what, uh, if you're running a code, whether the results you get actually make sense. So let's um, contrive 
an example to, to do that. Um, and that would be this, maybe let's use the geometry that we have here. I can't remember exactly. So we don't have to decide on the uh, geometry. Let's use a two element geometry that looks something like this and like this. And let's physically have it represent a particular kind of problem. And I guess it would be a problem, it's not a column, but it's a, a plain strain problem. And so the problem, let's call it x and y uh, for this case. And the z direction is the one that we're throwing away. And so let's figure out a problem where we apply a, uh, a stress to it. Um, and so we have one MPA applied on something that has a modulus of one gigapascal, not an unreasonable magnitude for rock. Water has a modulus of one two gigapascals, which is kind of surprising. No shear modulus, but a normal, a bulk modulus of one gigapascal. And a Poisson ratio that we could choose. So the easiest case, so we made the case that we would have plain strain and plain strain stress. So I said this, I didn't justify it. If Poisson ratio is zero, then basically plain stress conditions are exactly the equivalent of plain strain. So we could choose Poisson ratio of zero and, and get a quick result. So if that's the case, then what would we expect to, to happen? So we can just use the constitutive equations directly to be able to figure that out. If we apply a stress of 1 MPA here and um, we have uh, calculate what these are. Uh, what we could do, uh, if we went back to these constituent relationships, for instance, uh, we could just use it to calculate if we apply uh, actually, you need to use the reverse, uh, the inverse ones, right? You need to use the inverse ones. That's useful. So, if, for instance, we're applying a stress of one GPA, one MPA rather, and we're applying it, and each one of these are zero, then we could pretty easily calculate what the magnitudes of the strains would be. The strains would be equal to one minus Poisson ratio squared over modulus multiplied by the stress in 1, 1 is equal to the strain in 1, 1. And so let's, well, we, we said that's easy to do if you calculate Poisson ratio of 0, but if Poisson ratio is equal to, what's an easy one, uh, 0 0.2. Then 0 0.2, uh, is that is 0.2 times 0.2 is 0 0.04, is that right? And so that's uh, 0 0.96 divided by 1 times stress is equal to strain. And so in other words, this would be the, the, the multiplier, if you like, for the magnitude of uh, the strain that we get as a function of this. It's reduced slightly. It would be 1 uh, otherwise. So 0 0.2, 0 0.2 is 0.4. Yes, that is, that is right. And so we could also calculate the magnitude of the other strain in the other direction. And that would be what's a multiplier there. It's going to be 0 0.2 times 1 plus 0 0.2 over modulus, which is going to be whatever that is, 0 0.2 times 1.2 over modulus, which is uh, 0.24 over modulus. And so these are going to be the multipliers of our, our, displ our displacements. And so if we know what the stresses are that we're applying, we know the effective moduli are, 
we can check that the magnitudes of strains that come out of those should be those magnitudes. And so if we go back to this, and we choose for this geometry, I guess if we're doing it with Poisson ratio, then this magnitude, so if Poisson ratio is equal to zero, then the strain in the y direction is equal to 10 to the minus 3, I think, right? Strain in the x direction uh, is going to be equal to 0. And the Poisson ratio is equal to 0 0.2. Then the strain in the y direction is going to be equal to 0 0.96 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. And the strain in the z x direction is going to be the other number we had, 2.24, right? Minus 0 0.24. And so, in other words, when we load it, what's going to happen is this is going to go down, but this is going to go out by some small amount. So this is now the strain in x, which is this here. So this is the Poisson effect. So we now have some basis to be able to compare uh, behaviors. And so let's uh, make a mesh that represents this behavior and see what it comes out. Um, let's um, give, we could do it on EGFM or we could do it on Comsol. Let's give Comsol a try to see if we can get it. So I got my, so apparently, so that's what we're going to do. So what is this? This is my new thing here. So what is it that I want to do? Well, let's try this. Your command Cooper here. Let's see if it works. Seven work, uh, and actually seven work didn't work before. Ah, oh, fantastic! It works. I think it's going to work. Oh, no, no, it hasn't. <laughs> oh, that's good. I think it's going to work. All right, so we're in business. So we're doing this uh, job. We know we can make life easy by doing something that's maybe one by one in size. It has one MPA applied on here. Uh, it's plain strain, is what we're going to do. So it's straightforward to do that. We know if that's the case, then this displacement is either 1 or 0 0.96, depending on whether we're using plus or ratio is equal to 0 or 0 0.2. We know that this displacement should strain rather uh, times 10 to the minus 3. Those are strains, so those weren't meters on there, yes? And these strains uh, are either 0 or 0 0.24 times 10 to minus. So that's our conditions that we'd like to check against. So let's give it a go. Uh, very straightforward. So Comsol has, we're in 2D, you get to choose 3D. We haven't talked about this before, but we're, we're in 2D. We are in. Uh, structural mechanics, we have two choices, plain strain is a tougher one, uh, static is what we want, uh, transient is if there's a mass matrix, and eigenfrequency is where you manipulate it to find out the, the modes uh, which represent the, the characteristic frequency, characteristic deformation modes of a structure. Um, so we'll do that. I'll see if I can make this so it's you want a geometry which is uh, 
one by one. So the easiest way to do that is this, I think. Has uh, it done it? Uh, yep, yeah. a bit slow. This is the one that gets it in the middle. Go on, don't crash on me now. And moves. It is doing. It. It's just slow, I guess. I uh, don't know what that little feature is there. All right, so what do we do? Yeah, it's just just very slow. Doing something or it's just maybe so maybe we got in but maybe it's not any help to us so uh, well the yeah just just slow it is incredibly slow yeah so I don't know if it's connection or the machine it, it may well be the connection well, that's fine so backup plans good good always to have backup plan. Oh, no. So it asks, all right, so let's do it. So subdomain settings are some material properties. Material properties, what did we say? Uh, Poisson ratio, well, I always in encourage you to do the easiest one first, the one that you know it's going to be. Density is not going to make any difference. Thickness is one. Uh, physics, boundary conditions. So, what we're going to do is we're going to put it on rollers. This means, I guess, and rollers on the side. And so this allow going to allow it to expand this way and move along these rollers and expand this way because this axis here and this axis here cross is effectively going to be pinned at this point so I can't move. That's sometimes important because all of the, the laws that we have, um, the situative laws, for instance, define um, strains as a function of applied stresses. And so since a strain, so you can imagine that if you took this block and, and I applied a stress to it, the strain that would occur is defined by this matrix. But what it doesn't say is that whether this strain could occur here or it could just kind of float off here with any rigid body deformation that wouldn't affect the, the closure between the two faces. The strain should still be the same because the two faces are still the same distance apart, but they can be translated by some... Um, rigid body displacement, uh, which could be a thousand miles for that matter. And so you might have a strain of, uh, or of a displacement of this of 10 miles plus one millimeter, a displacement of this one of 10 miles, and therefore the closure between these is just one millimeter, but you have these huge numbers attached to it. So you, when you anchor it, you should physically anchor it to one point. And so by putting rollers on this, uh, we do that. So general notation, standard notation, Constraint is for either loads. Um, so this is restraint on this one would be in the x direction, which is zero. So that's rollers in this direction on that place. We oh, Does it take it if I don't save it? Yeah, it does. So on the bottom, we're going to have constraint in the y direction. And the other ones, we're not going to put any constraint on. So we've done that. That's what we've done. No, no displacement in, I presume this is x, and this is y. So hopefully that's right. And the other thing we need to do is put constraints on in terms of this. So this will be on this face in the uh, y direction. But this is going to be a uh, force. And actually, probably does take a stress into this case. If we're using EGFEM, it would be a force. But on this top surface, 
the load that we apply is a force in the y direction and forces are vectorals, they have magnitudes and directions so the force, no, it's not a force, it's actually a load uh, so it's newtons per meter squared so it's 1 e6 I guess but it's minus because right? it's acting downwards Okay, and that should be it uh, we don't have any force applied on here, so there's no constraint. So my guess, so you should think about what you expect to happen with this. So we put a Poisson ratio of zero on it. Uh, we said that for these particular cases, that means that this is going to go down by 1 times 10 to the minus 3 strain. Therefore, the displacement at the top, since this is 1 meter tall, should be 1 times 10. So, so u, y, it should be about... 10 to the minus 3 meters, 1 millimeter, this strain should be 0. And so you just need to check whether that really is the case. Uh, didn't it already make a mesh first? It looked like it did. I don't see it. So those are stresses. Uh, okay, let's go through. Uh, so cross section uh, domain plot parameters. So surface, we want to plot maybe strain. Strain normal strain in the y direction is going to be our vertical strain. What do we think it is? We think it's 10 times 10 to the minus 3. Not bad. That doesn't really show it very well, but I think that's exactly what it's telling us, right? Minus is in compression in this um, coordinate system. Didn't make the case, but kind of geological uh, sign conventions and structural mechanics sign conventions for stresses and strains are the reverses of each other. So compressive stresses in structural mechanics are negative, and compressive stresses in geological and geotechnical type classifications are positive. Normal strains in the y direct x direction horizontally, zero I think. It's not doing a very good job. 10 to the minus 16, yeah. So don't worry about 10 to the minus 16. So obviously compared to 10 to the minus 3, that is zero. And so it hasn't done a very good job for us. So what else are we going to do? We're going to, uh, I suppose, it's not plotting very nicely. That's not bad. This is plotting the total displacement as you go across it. I'm not sure I really defined a... Uh, oh, yeah, it's, it's plotting on, on this axis here. It's plotting the displacement as you go down. And so if we look at this, the, it's fixed at this bottom. So at point zero, which is this point here, or is zero. And as we go up to the top of the thing, it should actually be 1 times 10 to the minus 3, right? Because this is 1 meter tall, so this should have gone down 1 times 10 to the minus 3. Except for that. And so let's do the same by looking at changing the Poisson ratio. So we change Poisson ratio. What do we do? Physics. Subdomain settings. What do we say? 0.2. Uh, so this will have a body force in it. I imagine, I guess it'll probably execute if we have zero here. All of our calculations are assuming no, no self weight. Uh, don't want that. Post processing. It's not doing much fun for us. Um, what is the contour? So we wanted. What was I on before? Plot, domain plot parameters. So we wanted it to plot surface. So what did we say? The strains in the y direction were 0.96. Let's see if that really is the case. Oh, fantastic. 
and in the orthogonal direction, they should be uh, 0.24, right? Yeah, so, okay. So in other words, even though we can't physically see what it looks like, I don't know why that is particularly. Um, yeah, I, don't, I have no idea why that is. But it's giving us the right, right answers. Um, so what else could we do? Uh, I suppose uh, you know you could also represent a one-dimensional problem. In this particular case, if you wanted to represent a one-dimensional problem, then all you'd need to do, I suppose, is to set this constraint also equal to this, right? And so uh, if we do that, what do we expect to happen to the magnitudes of, uh, of the strengths? We could calculate it, right? We had this expression, which was, which I don't think is right, which is the modulus, effective modulus equals 1 minus 4 times Poisson ratio squared. Doesn't seem right to me. Um, so we can calculate the magnitude of the strains that we get in this particular case, I guess, right? One thing we could calculate would be what, one that we don't have to calculate, what's the strain in the x direction if we put this on wrong? It's not a trick question. So if you take something and you physically constrain it between two planes, Zero, right? yeah. so, so the strain in this direction should be zero. And you can imagine that if it's unconstrained, it deforms some amount. If you stop it from expanding in one direction, it deforms less. If you stop it from expanding the other direction, it deforms even less. And so we know in this particular case that with the Poisson ratio of 0.2, the vertical strain was of the order of Nine six times what it would be if it was unconstrained. So I guess you'd expect that the strain that would develop from doing this would be uh, less than ninety six percent. Calculate it out, but as again, I think that expression's wrong. And so we can. I guess I didn't run it. I think we constrained it, but I didn't run it. Uh, we don't want stress. We want domain. We want strains in the x direction, we said that these are zero, right? Well, right on. And we're banking on the fact that these ones should be uh, in the vertical direction, should be less um, yeah, that's right. So in the case where it's unconstrained, 1 is lower than 0.96. So I guess no. Okay, so it's less than 0.96, yeah. So even less than 0.96. So let's see what it is. Let's see if it's true. 0.9. Yeah, 0.9 times the magnitude. Which I don't think, uh, well, you can do the math, right? So, I'm pretty sure. so 0.2 squared is 0.04 times 4 times 0 squared is 1, 6. So this is uh, 0 0.8. So not that, but so, what does, I, for some reason I think it's 1 minus 2 mu squared. And is that because right, if this is 0 0.2, then this is 0 0.04, 0 0.8, this would be 0 0.92. So that's not quite right either, if this, if this magnitude is right. But in other words, it's giving us the right orders of, of magnitude. Uh, what else is worthwhile chatting about? Um, the problem, well, not a problem, but one of the issues, I guess, in using things like ComSol is you don't really fig really know exactly how it's doing all the things it's doing. Um, if we wanted to, I won't pull out EG at the end, but I will make the point, uh, you can do it on here, or I can do it on this sheet, I suppose, um, is that if we wanted to, for instance, go ahead and represent this case that we have here, maybe with uh, simple geometry that includes well, I guess simple geometry could just be 
one element, two elements together, representing this behavior. But the point uh, in this is that if we're applying a stress on this face of equal to one megapascal, then physically, what we'd how we'd have to think about that is that the uh, we know that the shape functions kind of map magnitudes of forces across um, between each of the nodes. And so the bottom line is, is if we wanted to uh, solve it in EGFEM, it's going to ask us for magnitudes of nodal forces at each one of these elements. And so uh, if we want the stress to be equal to this, then the total force is going to be equal to the total area times the stress, which is equal to 1, which is would be 1 mega newton. And so what we'd have to apply is half of that at each of these nodes. Which seems kind of straightforward, right? So make, makes sense. What might see, not seem so obvious, since I've got two minutes to, uh, to spend out here, is what should this look like if it is a geometry that we choose to discretize like this? So slightly more elements. Actually, there's no benefit in this in using more elements. But if we wanted to do this, and you carry out this same kind of idea of thinking about what the, the shape functions do in mapping these forces, then if you look at the shape functions for this uh, central node, and if you look at the mapping for the sh shapes at the subsidiary nodes, then uh, if this was still one meter across here and you still wanted to apply the same load then what you what are the magnitudes you'd apply? What's the proportion? Is it 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33 or is it 0.25 0.25 yeah, yeah. yeah I'm just going to write it as 0 0.25 plus yes yeah, right so this central one is 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 and this outer one is 0 0.25 so this one is 0 0.5. Right? And so the rationale of that is that the shape functions are doing that. You don't have to do that, I don't think, in the consult, because it takes care of it. But you might want to understand the, the reasons for why. So if you wanted to run EGFEM, I think it would solve the problem. And it's just, so how big would the, the, the matrices be in this case? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 um, degrees of freedom. We have 2 degrees of freedom uh, for each number of displacements. We have 3 stresses and strains, x, y, and shear stress, but we only have two degrees of freedom. So it would be an 18 by 18 system of equations that would be solved. I'm pretty sure that Matt might do that. Sure. Perfect. Right. That's it. So um, we talked about uh, solid mechanics, talked about the fact that we need to understand the constituent relationships. That's the only thing that's different between um, Navier-Stokes and uh, the Navier equations of solid elasticity. Um, it's not so easy, it's not feasible for us to just cut them down in size when we move from one dimension, three dimensions to two to one dimension, which we often want to do. We have to decide on the constraints that we apply, either plane strain or plane stress, and its equivalence in uh, the one dimensional system. And once we do that, everything seems to make sense. We can use the constitutive equations importantly to be able to validate very simple models to make sure that we really know what we're applying. 
Obviously, uh, ComSol should work. It does things. You're not sure of that. It probably does. But what sometimes you don't know is what does it mean by this choice of boundary condition? And so you can test it in your own mind. And so being able to do that in a quantitative sense, I think, uh, is important. So that's kind of where we are with this. Yeah, we're, we're all set. You can start packing up. I'm just uh, rambling. We'll uh, start talking about uh, poor elasticity. So now we've covered uh, diffusion problems for fluid diffusion, advection diffusion problems, Navier-Stokes, and solid mechanics. Now, with these matrices that we've had that we haven't really revisited, there's no reason why we can't start thinking about what the individual cross-coupling coefficients are as we start looking at the linkages between different mechanics. So now we're in a position now to, for instance, couple solid mechanics with the equations that describe fluid flow. And so, and not just solve them independently, but solve their interaction. Take a sponge, you put a sponge in a bag, you load the sponge, it's a porous medium with fluids in it. What are the fluid pressures that develop up as you load it? So that interaction is kind of a classic consolidation problem. But now we're in a position to be able to do that. We need to figure out what the cross linkages are between the solid mechanics equations and the flow equations. And it'll turn out that the linkages are that in the solid mechanics equation, we have an equivalent body force to represent that. And in the fluid flow equations, we have an extra source, which is given by the volume strain in the other ones. So those become the off diagonal.